Hello. In this lecture, we are going to learn about object-oriented concepts. Uh, many of the pictures I used in this presentation are taken from the book, from the classic book by Grady Bush, Concepts of Object-Oriented Programming. Let us begin with the problems faced with procedural languages. What are procedural languages? Languages like Fortran, COBOL, C, etc. are known as procedural languages. The main problem with these languages is that data does not have an owner. This leads to a problem of difficulty in maintaining the data integrity. Why is it so? The main building blocks of a procedural language are functions. Whether it's a Fortran program or a C program, functions are the building blocks of the program. Now, many functions can modify a given block of data. So, when the data gets corrupted, or something goes wrong with the data, it becomes very difficult to pinpoint which function has misbehaved to create the bug. Here's a picture. We have uh, here function 1, function 3 and function 2 all are using a sh shared data. The other problem with procedural languages is the very common bug of uninitialized variables. One of my favorite programs which I ask my students is this program. Declare an int k and print the value. It usually prints some unknown garbage value and this is a problem of uninitialized variables. Another big problem with procedural languages is the resource deallocation problems. What are resources? Resources can be anything starting from memory to files to open database connections and network connections. What happens in this code here? We have declared here int star kp and we have allocated a block of 1000 bytes to this pointer kp. Again we have allocated another 1000 bytes to this pointer kb and yet again we have allocated 1000 bytes to the pointer kb. Now at the end of this code 2000 bytes of memory becomes unavailable to the rest of the program causing what is known as a memory leak. Memory allocated but unusable because we have lost the pointer to that memory. Another a big problem with procedural languages is the insufficient support for abstraction. Let us take a case of an abstract data type. An abstract data type has two parts. One is the definition of the data. Second is the definition of the operations or functions which can be applied on the data. Now, in a language like C, the data can be modeled as structures, but the functions are global and not related to the structure. Now let us see what is abstraction. Abstraction focuses upon the essential characteristics of some object relative to the perspective of the viewer. This definition is from the classic book by Grady Butch and this is a picture which accompanies that. You can see it is the same cat but from the viewpoint of the owner, the old lady on the left, she sees it as a cute little fur ball which eats some food and makes cute little sounds. But from the viewpoint of the veterinary surgeon on the right, the cat has got parts like kidneys, intestines, bladder, liver, etc. So the two people have different abstract models of the same cat. Let's come back to the problem of uh, ADTs and modeling them. Suppose we have a structure stack here which has an int top and a cat star store. This is the array. Then we have two functions push and pop. In the same program, we also have a queue which has a structure with a front and a rear and a store. It has functions insert and delete. Now, in a typical C program, all functions are global. The push, the pop, the insert and the delete functions are all global. That means the program has no way of knowing that push and pop belong to the struct stack and that insert and delete belong to the struct queue. Or in other words, insert and delete are not applicable to stacks, push and pop are not applicable to queue. The compiler has no method. Let's take another example of a structure horse which has a weight, a color and an age as its members. And we have a structure eagle which has a eight weight and a wingspan. The eagle flies and hunts. The horse can gallop and canter. Now all functions are global. That means the C compiler has no method of knowing that horses cannot fly and that eagles cannot gallop. 
so if there is any illegal call it has to be handled at runtime and it could lead to some errors let us see how we can get better abstraction using an object oriented language here we see a stack where the pop and the push functions have been pushed into the class and similarly the insert and the delete functions of the queue are pushed into the envelope of the class queue now with this information the compiler knows that these two functions belong explicitly to stack and that the insert and the delete function belong explicitly to the queue edit now if i try to use the insert on a stack or a push on a queue the compiler can give an error so we say that a class is the definition of the state and the behavior the state is defined by the data members the top and the char star store for stack the front and the rear and the store for a queue the behavior or the set of operations which are valid for that given class are defined by the operations or the functions the push and the pop for the stack the insert and the delete for the queue in the same way we can now see that for the horse and the class the functions of the horse gallop and canter have been encapsulated inside the class and the functions fly and hunt have been encapsulated into the class eagle now the compiler can catch an error of a flying horse or a galloping eagle very easily once again class equal to state plus behavior the state is defined by the data members or the fields of the class by the age and the weight and the wingspan of the eagle the behavior of the horse is defined by the two functions gallop canter the behavior of the eagle is defined by the two functions fly and hunt looking further on the class equal to state plus behavior equation the state is often referred to as data members if we are talking about c++ programs in other languages like java they are known as fields uh, visual basic programmers like to call them properties but these are just the different jargon used in different programming languages similarly the behavior is defined by what are known as methods in uh, language like java c++ programmers like to call them member functions but do remember that these are one and the same what is an object again the definition from grady butch an object has state exhibit some well defined behavior and has a unique identity this is again the picture from the butch book it has a state it looks like this the hammer looks like this it has a behavior the hammer is used to hit nails and every hammer is different from the other hammers out here a class represents a set of objects that share a common structure and a common behavior once again a definition from the grady butch book this is the cartoon which represents that a class is a set of objects which are similar now suppose i got a garden let's talk about other issues i got a garden in which i'm growing different kinds of flowers the garden is public now that creates a problem it faces a threat from people from donkeys and from rabbits which might attack the garden in different ways we got a problem how do we solve it suppose i build a very high fence around my my garden very 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 high fence around my garden and enclose the complete garden my flowers are safe but i got a new problem i can't use my own garden let's go to the next solution now we have a private garden with a guard i hire a guard i hire a guard and i give him proper instruction as to who is authorized to use the garden and who is not now outside people who come to use the garden have to take the permission of the guard to be allowed to do any operation on the garden and this keeps my garden safe and i can access the flowers for my own use so we have write functions to safeguard data suppose this is my data in text and there is a rule that x must be between 0 and 100 this is some kind of a business rule which comes from the problem statement so any request to change x does not work directly on the data as it would work in a procedural language it must send the request to my function my function will then try to change the value 
this is the concept of the outside world talking to the guard the guard is allowed to access the flowers in my garden now let's see what it looks like in code this is my function modify x the guard function sends a new value if the new value is illegal then i print an error and exit this is not code i just written pseudo code otherwise the value is changed to the new value so by doing this i'm ensuring that the business rule of x is less than or equal to 100 and greater than or equal to 0 is enforced at all times the data integrity is never compromised the read function looks like this so the first law of object oriented programming is encapsulation data must be hidden all data is private read access through write read functions and write access through write functions for every piece of data this leads to four different possibilities either we allow both reading and writing that is we can access the data and we can modify the data or read only that means we can access the data but are not allowed to modify write only we can modify but cannot access in terms of reading no access is absolutely no reading or writing encapsulation hides the details of the implementation of an object this is a definition from grady butch this is a cartoon from the grady butch the internals of the cat all these are the internals of the cat are hidden from us we only see the external interface of the cat what does the cat look like from outside Inter internal details are hidden this is what is known as encapsulation now we have a new problem if the garden had only weeds to begin with putting the guard doesn't change it this is the pro problem of improper initialization so what we do is to initialize objects properly we have special functions called constructors constructors ensure correct initialization of all data they are automatically called at the time of object creation the other problem of resource deallocation is handled properly through the functions called destructors which ensure the correct deallocation of all resources before an object goes or dies or it is removed from the memory in this slide we look at the life cycle of an object what we need is that object should be properly initialized or in other words born healthy this is ensured using constructors objects should maintain their integrity of the data that means function should not be allowed to uh, destroy the data or make it invalid this is ensured using the read write functions and the object should die cleanly or when they go out of scope and are cleared up they should deallocate all the resources which they allocated this is ensured using the functions destructors so we can see that the constructors are the brahma the read write functions are the vishnu and the destructor is maheshwara the holy trinity of object oriented programming next let's look at the anatomy of a class or the parts of a class first of all we divide all the parts into two areas one is the private and the second is the public the public part is what is visible to all other classes and through which other classes can interact with our class so let's look at what do we have first of all we have the data which must be private as we have seen earlier the principle of encapsulation says that data must be private next we have the read write functions which are used by the outside classes to interact with our data these are public functions next we have the constructors and the destructors and finally we have the implementer functions or the editing functions of the class these are the functions for which the class exists this is the set of functions for which we have developed our class it could be run fly pop push whatever you have in addition we could also have some private functions which are used only by the other functions of the class and are not available to the outside classes so this set of functions which are available to the outside classes is known as the public interface of the class let us look at another concept called inheritance which is essentially code reuse at the binary level so what we have is we have a class stack 
it has functions pop and push. Now we would like to add another function to it, but now with a new complication. We do not have the source code of the stack class with us. That means we only have the binaries, we do not have the source code. How can we extend the functionality of the stack to another class called stack1? That means we want to extend the functionality of the class stack or in other words, we want a specialized function which does everything that stack does plus something extra. A class may inherit the structure and behavior of its superclass. This is the official definition of Grady Booch in his book. So here we have a grandfather and a father and a son who all inherit the obvious property of having a very very long nose. Now, in the single inheritance we get a tree structure or what are known as a inheritance trees based on the is a relationship. What do you have here? We can say that human is a specialized ape. Ape is a specialized mammal. A mammal is a specialized vertebrate. A vertebrate is a specialized animal. Please note that the arrow goes from the derived class towards the base class. So this forms an inheritance tree or an is a relationship tree. Another simpler example would be example of a manager. Manager is also an employee but with some additional features. So manager is an employee. It's an is a relationship. Now what is the best nomenclature when we're talking about these two classes in the inheritance tree? The best recommended one is base class and a derived class. The other two nomenclatures which I do not recommend are the pairs of words super class and subclass. Somehow we get the idea that the superclass is bigger and the subclass is smaller. And similarly, when we use the words parent class and child class, we get the idea of a big parent and a small child. While in fact, the base class in fact is smaller than the derived class. Because in the derived class, we have all the functionality of the base class plus the additional functionality of the derived class, which is extra. So in fact, in terms of the code and the number of functions, the derived class is larger than the base class. So we really recommend the use of the words base class and derived class when talking about inheritance. Let's look at multiple inheritance. Suppose we have a class called horse, we need to create a flying horse. One way would be to add the functionality of flying to horse and get it. Another easier way would be to derive its functionality from two classes, a horse and an eagle. We get the functionality of a horse from a horse and the functionality of flying from an eagle. So this leads to quicker code development. One class having more than one base class is known as multiple inheritance. When we have multiple inheritance, the inheritance structure resembles a graph. Here we have A from which we have derived classes B, C and uh, class E is derived from B, class D derives from C, G is derived from E and F is derived from F is derived from B, H is derived from F, G, D and A. One class can have multiple base classes. Now what happens is the structure of a graph is generally more complicated than a tree. This leads to the difficulty of maintenance of the code. Suppose there is a bug in the class H. We would have to examine almost all the codes of this tree or the graph uh, to find the bug. Another problem which we get in multiple inheritance is ambiguity in function calls. So here is the structure of an inheritance tree in single inheritance which is simpler and easier to maintain the bugs. Suppose you find that the code of gorillas is malfunctioning or there is a bug in it. We only have to check the code of apes, gorillas, mammals, vertebrates and animals in order to find the bug. We do not have to examine the other classes. Another problem with multiple inheritance is ambiguity of function calls. Our flying horse becomes hungry. It wants to eat. So should it eat like a horse or should it eat like an eagle? That is, should it eat grass and oats or should it hunt rabbits and do something else? This ambiguity has different solutions. Uh, 
but all of them lead to further complications and the maintenance of the code. Next we come to another feature of object oriented programming that is modularity. The modularity is the packaging of abstractions into discrete units. We have classes, we have packages, we have domains or namespaces. This is a picture of modularity from the Grady Butch book. Yet another very very important feature of object oriented programming is strong typing. Strong typing prevents mixing abstraction. This is the definition given by Grady Butch. What does it mean for us? Let's look at this simple statement. Y is assigned to X. This statement will, allowed, will be allowed in the language if and only if X and Y are objects of the same class. Otherwise they are not allowed. Now what would be weak typing? Weak typing would be to allow some violations as in C we can assign a float to an int and a int to a float and the other extreme of an untyped language or what is known as dynamic typing. For example Lisp, JavaScript etc. where variables have no type they can take on any value assigned to them. What does this mean in simple words? Object oriented programming languages avoid putting a square peg into a round hole or a round peg into a square hole. This is strong typing. Another feature is concurrency. Concurrency allows different objects to act at the same time. An example would be Java support of multithreading is a form of concurrency. Different objects acting at the same time. Another major issue is persistence. This is a major issue in modern object oriented programming languages. How do we store the state of a class or an object in permanent storage media? That is, while my program is running, the values of the variables of the object are stored in random access memory. That is volatile memory. How do I store it in permanent storage so that I can close down the program and restart it after some time and get back the values? So this is what is known as the problem of storage or persistent storage. So there are different uh, techniques allowed in different languages. Object simulation is supported in Java and in C Sharp and many other languages. This also leads to different schemes of storing objects in a relational database management system using what are known as object relational mapping schemes. We are trying to store the cat in permanent storage here. Picture from the Grady Butch book. So, to recap, let's look at the four major features of object oriented programming. They are abstraction or modeling, encapsulation or implementation hiding, inheritance which could be single or multiple and modularity. And the other three features which are also very important for object oriented programming in the modern context are strongly typed and they should support concurrency and there should be a mechanism to persist the state of objects across time. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience in going through the video on object oriented concepts. If you want to send your comments and queries, kindly send them to my email id ravipiredi at gmail.com. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much once again.